Well, a few years later, I don't know how many VCRs he moved, but Lex Luger <laughs> became a big star in wrestling. And of course, this past weekend, AE, AE I did this again. <laughs> Every time, A and E, with no W, A and E had another of their biographies, their WWE series of biographies. And this one, certainly one a lot of people have been waiting to see. We heard about a documentary on him a few years ago, but a documentary on Lex Luger. Well, yes, and apparently this consisted, um, I guess in, in large part, I know they did some re-editing, but a lot of the documentary on Luger that they had done, as you mentioned a couple of years ago, and shelved uh, was represented here, so they already had some of the work done. And as evidenced by the fact that I was in this, because those comments, everybody must think purple's my favorite color. Just in case anybody was was wondering, uh, those comments were done at the same time as all the other comments that you've seen from me on WWE programming back in 2017 when they came down here and shot some stuff leading up to the Hall of Fame induction where I indicted the rock and roll express into the hall of fame so no it wasn't it wasn't new stuff because um well i'm not even gonna go there but anyway <laughs> um well I, all right i'll go yes they did call me but i don't want to say that and act like oh yeah they were calling me but i turned them down because i did but just because i didn't want to be affiliated at this stage of the game with any current pro wrestling promotion because that would then skew my potentially my credibility when I critique things. So I wished them well in their future endeavors and their producer, I won't mention his name. If they know that I like him, they might fire him, but he's a very nice guy and he's on the ball. But anyway, um, you know, this was another, I, I knew Lex 35 years ago, met him when he first came to Crockett and you know, worked with him for quite some time, still didn't know a, a lot of these details about his early life and his football career. And then, obviously, when Lex, the last time that I was around him for any length of time was when he left the WWF in 95 in such spectacular fashion, showing up on the first live Nitro. And I knew that you know, especially in the early 2000s after WCW had been sold, that he his life took a turn for the worse. But I was not prepared for the number of arrests. I don't, I didn't know it was it was that bad. He went downhill very quickly at that point. But it would. This was another one where the outside the ring story may kind of have overshadowed the inside the ring. Like we mentioned last, you know, last week with. Uh, with Goldberg, this one again, you know, that's the thing about it was an uplifting ending to what you would have thought was going to be a real sad, tragic story. But as as I mentioned, because I'd seen him at a fan fest several a couple of years before the comments that I made in this, Lex was friendlier and happier and more contented and adjusted now than after all these you know, incidents in his life than he ever was when he was on top of the world. And so it's kind of a, another version of a redemption story, if you will. He couldn't seem more likable than he does right now. Yes. And that's the thing is, you know, you never know how things are going to work out because it wasn't that, and I've said this before, it wasn't that Lex was a flaming asshole. He was an aloof kind of guy and he was, confident and somewhat conceited he wasn't a bully that you know uh, i'm a big jacked up you know guy with a great physique so i'm going to grab people and slap them around but he could be arrogant he was very physically gifted but he also came into a world with a bunch of guys who in some ways were physically gifted but had paid dues and and had spent time and effort to get where they got, and then they see the you know the bodybuilder and the football player come in and handed something, and there was a natural you know tension from that, and then with the way Lex could come off, as we've talked about it, sometimes not even knowing it, just not you know not being aware that other people were taking him in that fashion, 
you know, that's and and it was a, a theme of this show that he was a little bit selfish or he thought about himself, you know, in in a lot of these situations. And he himself admits that now he's learned that he came in and, you know, was with all that publicity and all that money, it was taken the wrong way. But he really, they made the point halfway through when it didn't work out in the WWF and he was floating and then finally got the chance to, I guess we're getting ahead of the show, but when he finally got the chance to go to WCW and really dug in and started working and putting in the, the time, that's when people took him the people he worked with took him better. And it's still, it, that's, that's the thing. He had success in both of his runs in WCW and his one excursion to the WWF was remembered by, you know, every time now they drop colored balloons, people laugh and think of, yeah, that's when Lex was a plate full of piss. Cause they had that clip. That's what I had done. They aired it on here. I was surprised to hear that phrase. Yes. But th I had done an interview on whatever it was at WWF radio or whatever their radio program was back then. And as a heel, as the manager of Yokozuna, and, you know, they said, well, we can talk a little more open on the radio or whatever. I said, yeah, well, if he don't win this thing, he's going to look like a plate full of piss. And son of a gun, that's exactly what happened. And he, it, it, it never recovered from that. I'm not saying he was the guy to put the belt on, but once they had put him in that position, well, let's, let's go through it. Um, Can I ask you a question? Cause go ahead. I don't want you to go past it and I don't get to ask it. Because I thought about you right away. When he talked in here about playing football in Memphis yeah. <laughs> and going around town and everyone's like, oh, wrestling's big, you should be a wrestler. Was that the same story he told you when you asked him about Memphis wrestling? Well, no, the way he said, he said they thought he was a wrestler. They would ask him first, are you a wrestler in Memphis? Because the Memphis, what was it? USFL team was what it was, but wrestling in Memphis was wrestling. So that's what, you know, what people, the first thought people would have when they see a guy like that, are you a wrestler? No, I'd actually ended up on a plane next to him one time flying somewhere. And just making conversation, because I knew he had played in Memphis, I said, well, you must have watched, you know, the Memphis wrestling show while you were living there, playing there. He said, oh, it was on sometimes when we come back from practice, when we come back in the locker room. <laughs> but it, it, he was just like, you know, oblivious that he would have actually watched wrestling before. I said, okay. I said, well, I had to ask him. I said, Lex, what would you have done? If you'd had to start in Memphis or in Florida like everybody else for, you know, 300 bucks a week. And he said, oh, I wouldn't have done that. Which, see, that's kind of the way that he came off to me or to if he'd have said that to anybody else in the locker room. We all had done that. Maybe not in Memphis, but somewhere else. And he just scoffed at it like because he didn't. And that's the way the guys used to think, you know what? If you don't want to be in the fucking business and you, you know, the only reason you're here is because they're handing you a bunch of money and we're having to carry you, fuck it, right? Some guys, you know, they can say, okay, we can make some money with this big jug head. You know, not saying they said jug head about Luke, but I'm just saying if you get some guy like that, that's, you know, got resentment because he's been handed something and you've got to carry him, whatever. Well, at least fair. Well, we maybe we can make some money with the jughead, but that was kind of sometimes the way Lex would come off, just like scoffing, like you know, because he didn't know anything about any of the boys in the locker room. He had never watched wrestling, never been a wrestling fan. He was seeing these people. As a matter of fact, that was, I think, one of the comments that made his debut in the ring was at his. He was at his first live pro wrestling show ever. So when he. He didn't know at first to be intimidated when he walks into Crockett locker room and there's Ric Flair and there's Tully Blanchard and there's Arn Anderson and there's whoever. He didn't know who was good and who wasn't. How about Percy? First guy to manage Luger? First guy to manage Undertaker? Yeah. 
Percy, well, that Florida um, stint, he had almost everybody there. Percy was he had Rick integral. Rude. Yeah. yeah, Rude from like 85 to 87. But I did not know that Lex Luger's father was a piano virtuoso. Pianist. Uh, well, he okay, he may have been a dick. But that's he still, he was a piano virtuoso. We had a friend of the family that was a world famous pianist. But when I was a teenager, my grandmother sent it to me and she said, he was a world famous pianist. And I thought she said world famous <laughs> penis. You know, did you ever hear the story that, you know, my uncle, he owned a bar, owned a bar. And people used to come in the bar all the time. One day this guy walks in a bar. My uncle looks up. He sees this guy and on the guy's shoulder is a little fucking piano and a little fucking 12 inch tall man sitting at that piano playing it. And he asked the guy, he said, so what the hell is this? I see on your shoulder, you've got a little tiny piano and a little tiny 12 inch man sitting at it, playing it. And the guy said, well, you know, it's a long story, but it went something like this. I shipwrecked on a deserted Island. And when I woke up, there was a bottle laying next to me and I picked the bottle up and I tried to rub the label to see if I could read what it was. And out of the bottle popped a genie and the genie said for releasing me from this bottle, I will grant you any one wish that you so desire, whatever it is in the world. And my uncle said, well, wait a minute. You could have had anything you wanted in the entire world, money, jewelry, fame, whatever. And you asked for this? And the guy said, well, actually, no. The problem was the genie was hard of hearing. I asked for a 12-inch penis. All right, well, let's get away from the penis and get back to the package. <laughs> back to the package. So after the Canadian Football League and Green Bay, he was injury-prone, went to Tampa Bay, then went to Memphis. He went to the office in Florida and talked to Hiro Matsuda, and there you go. And you saw the training footage that they showed with him and Matsuda doing the weird calisthenics that, you know, the, the Japanese wrestlers used to do all those insane calisthenics and different involved and squats. intricate cardio exercises and squats and everything that footage of Luger doing that with hero. That's the same kind of footage that I was talking about. Remember when we, we talked about Paul Orndorff and I said, it made a big splash when he was a rookie and, they, and Eddie Graham sent him to work for Jerry Jarrett in Memphis. They put him right on top because he looked so fantastic, but they had that footage of him and Bob Backlund doing those things where they do, they lock leg and legs and do back bridges and do sit-ups off of each other and push-ups with each other on their back. And that was, you know, cool shit. And you, it made wrestlers look like these conditioning freaks, right? What would have happened if Luger had walked in there a year earlier when Eddie Graham was still alive? Boy, howdy. I mean, Eddie Graham would have seen something instantly and probably put him with Matsuda. Uh, I don't know if he would have, at that point, they probably wouldn't have pushed Luger so hard right at the start because I think he would have known it was counterproductive to Florida because contradict me if I'm wrong, but did Lex Luger ever mean anything for the business in Florida? It was almost ready to go under at that point. Right. They gave him a big push. It didn't really matter. I mean, he worked with Wyndham, but it was a dying promotion. Yeah, and and the thing is... Ed Gantner. Yeah, it, it, I think Eddie Graham, they wouldn't have been in that position maybe if he was still alive, but if they were, he would have known that what they were doing was just hot shot in this new prospect. They weren't going to get anything out of it because he was so green, and they would just hurt the territory because and then they couldn't keep him as soon as... Flair worked with him and went back to Crockett. Same thing he did with the Midnight Express and me. Same thing he did with other guys when he'd go to the territories. He'd go back to Crockett and say, they got this guy or they got that guy or what? we need so-and-so. So when Crockett brought him in and they could hide him in the horseman, he looked like a million dollars. They could protect him until he got his feet under him. That's when he made an impact just being 
you know, on his own and managed by Percy Pringle in Florida, which was almost dead to begin with, it, it the hot shot name at that point just did right. further damage to their business. What I meant was, you know, he didn't get his leg broken. He didn't get beat up and chased out of the building. Do you think Eddie Graham would have chased him off? No. Because he was a football player wanting to be a wrestler all of a sudden for big money? Or do well, you think no. he would have embraced it? Think about this. Eddie Graham was noted for real athletes, whether they be a Jack Briscoe, an NCAA champion, or Wahoo McDaniel, pro football player, all the football players and amateur wrestlers and athletes of some description that Eddie Graham pushed. They like to tell the story that they broke Hogan's leg. Was Hogan a football star? Was Hogan a fucking... Um, mainstream no. sports attraction. No, Hogan was a bassist in a fucking local band. That's the kind of, even though he was big, and look at those pictures of him then. He looked like a fucking halfway of putts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just face it. So those were the kind of people they broke their fucking leg to try to run them off because they figure, if, you know, this guy ain't going to have the balls to to stick with it or whatever. And they didn't want to smarten up some guy was going to go out and tell all of his friends in his band and all the people at the bars in Tampa. But if you've got a guy that's already like Luger, it's already played pro football is just coming off of that and has that physique and fucking, you know, you, you need, you need talent on your roster. You're going to give that a look no matter what. Were you surprised to see how thick he was when he played football? Yes, that would, because he always, I'd only seen him, you know, when he was in wrestling condition, and I didn't realize that he was that thick at one point. And, but that's the thing we've talked about. Lex was an amazing athlete. And when you look at this biography, you realize that from the time that he broke into wrestling until the SummerSlam 93 main event wasn't seven full years. So... He really, trial by fire, when, you know, we talked about by 88, 89, 90, he had really come on at his own to where if he was around a day at that size with that body and could still move and work like that, he'd be one of the top guys in the business. But we, you know, I say we, the top guys who had seen him come in as a, you know, wide-eyed kind of arrogant rookie were still there, ah, it's Luger. But his work got good quick. And, you know, up to the SummerSlam 93 main event, he was always a top guy in the business. And then that, because they had seen, and I, they played this comment in the show from me, he was more natural as a heel. He didn't connect in a friendly, warm way with people. He could be aloof and arrogant and condescending and come off as a heel. He was better than everybody else. And that's how, but Vince wanted that physique and wanted him to be the All-American. And when he soured on that, because I'll tell you what, the goddamn, the, uh, the bus was a rib. They made him take that bus all over the fucking country, that Lex Express. With and, Bruce. <laughs> and well, Bruce wasn't on it the whole time. <laughs> a week Bruce was would, enough. Bruce would bop in. And But he even had to ride that thing to TV. So whereas they had Jim Crockett, because they'd interviewed Jim Crockett before his death uh, for, I guess, some of the other DVDs they'd done, but they had him in the can saying Lex was an egomaniac. But that's a good thing. Because a top star, you want to have a healthy ego. But where, where Lex's ego was sometimes, part of it was perception, as we said, and part of it was him being aloof. And part of it was he didn't want to go through that shaking hands and kissing baby stuff. It wasn't him. And people could tell. And that's by the time that Vince did that finish at SummerSlam, thinking he could prolong it. And then he soured quick. And that was the end of Lex and the WWF. He just had to bide his time and work that contract out. But, I mean, he went to partners with Davey Boy and then to just a flunky. The other thing, though, about the Lex Express and the whole patriotic babyface turn. Other than slamming Yokozuna on the Intrepid on July 4th, it was like a manufactured patriotism drive. 
There was no yes. big movement in the country, you know, in 1993. <laughs> you know, and again, who were his opponents? Yokozuna, then Ludwig Borgo. Like, these were not the countries we were at war with in any way. Some would say maybe in business with Japan, but beyond that, it was like manufactured. It wasn't like doing this with Luger in the middle of 1984 or something. It was doing it at a time where the country wasn't where Vince was. No, Vince just, he had an idea, and I bet you, once again, I don't know how they came up with the Intrepid. He might have seen something on television. Fourth of July ceremony, it ticked his, you know, creative juices or whatever. You know what? This was the most New York City-centric time in WWF history after yes. the first expansion, and that was in the middle of Manhattan. Well, on the water, but you get my yeah. point. Well, depending on the rainfall, it could be in the middle of Manhattan. Um, but it, but that's the thing is, Vince, you know, okay, the, it was manufactured patriotism that people at that point could see through, but Vince didn't know they could see through it. And, uh, there, I mean, there was a lot of things Vince was doing at that point in time that he didn't know people could see through. And the World Bodybuilding Federation deal... I remember that plain as day because everybody was talking about it, that basically Vince had been able to sign Luger from away from WCW, even with an existing contract, because he wasn't signing him to wrestle. And the independent contractor contracts back then didn't cover anything but wrestling. And so he signs him to the World Bodybuilding Federation for a year, which everybody knew was Luger sitting out his WCW kind. And then he had the motorcycle wreck, nearly killed himself, almost lost his arm. I, I didn't know that it was that close, or his leg, rather. Or no, his arm. It was his arm, because remember um, he had it the, was steel, his arm. Plate yeah, the his arm. steel plate But I didn't know that it was that close that they were going to amputate until he called Sting, and Sting got a hold of Jim Andrews. And they got him to Birmingham, or elsewise he'd have... <laughs> John Laurinaitis could have signed the world's first one-armed wrestler. Uh, but that was from almost losing his arm to making the WWF debut six months later. And in that condition he was in, they ain't made steroids that'll do that yet unless you have the genetics. There had to be some goddamn genetic key to Lex Luger's chromosomes. That, But anyway... Uh, did you like when Bruce said, I didn't know what a narcissist, narcissist was <laughs> until he, sh he should have every morning when he gets up and looks in the mirror in his bowl of magic spoon. But, um, and Bobby Heenan gave him the big introduction, looking in the full length mirror. I remember seeing that at the time that it happened. And you see the backstage footage of Vince practicing with the mirror girls that they'd got. He, whenever Vince gets in the ring, and is producing something for somebody specifically. He doesn't do it as much as he used to. He used to do it a little bit more, but he, it's his idea. He likes it. He wants it to work. And you could tell that he, you know, again, the physique, I think, was Vince's bonding with Luger, the bodybuilding and the whole nine yards. But he decided, okay, this guy's not going to be a heel. He's going to be my next Hulk Hogan. And he needed an opponent for Yokozuna. And he felt, okay, the foreign menace, 4th of July, coming up on SummerSlam, American hero, whatever. Uh, it was nice to see him interview Vladimir. I guess that's the only footage Vladimir's going to get. They've shelved his documentary. But anyway, yeah, the bus was, I think, the downfall of Lex Luger's WWE career. And I felt bad for him actually watching that. You hear about how miserable he is. You see him whining about not getting healthy food while Bruce is there all bloated. But think about it. Nonstop, everywhere he went, he had to put on patriotic clothing. That red, white, and blue <laughs> shirt or the Zubaz red, white, and blue pants or whatever he had. Nonstop. You know, all of a sudden, this guy's like Mr. Rah Rah America. It was so dumb when you really look at it. And you feel bad for him having to do this. Well, anyway, Bruce gave a kind of confusing explanation of why that he didn't win the title at SummerSlam, but I was told at the time, since I was counsel for the opponent, that Vince wanted to prolong... I think I was told by Vince that Vince wanted to prolong it till WrestleMania. That, that never came. 
And and now Lex wasn't happy and WWF wasn't happy with him. And the story with the, the contract deal, of course, Bruce is like, well, he continually lied and said he was going to sign. And I think he was probably going to sign because he had no place else to go because of the way that he had, you know, left before. But then he got Sting to intervene with Bischoff and Bischoff admitted he wanted no part of him. And so he lowballed him <laughs> to try to get him to turn it down. He offered him $150,000. And I, I was not ever privy to that information either. So Lex wanted to get the fuck out of Dodge. Because I don't care how bad they were using him. Even in 1995, he was probably going to gross with the WWF a bit more than 150 grand. But uh, You thought you he, wanted to get out of Connecticut. Yeah, he really wanted to get out of Connecticut. He took it and made the surprise debut and et cetera. And, and that got everybody's attention. And honestly, Lex went from nobody to somebody overnight because in the WWF with what they were doing with him and the run he'd had, he meant zip, nothing. But as soon as he does that, not only is everybody talking about him, but he's back at the scene of his greatest triumphs in WCW where the people remembered him against Sting and against Flair and with the horsemen of whatever. It hadn't been that long. So he got reinvigorated and gave WCW a, a pretty big boost there for their new program all at the same time. And then, you know, I got to be honest, I did not remember... Lex Luger beating Hulk Hogan with the torture rack until they showed the footage. In the same building where he beat Yokozuna via countout. Yes. And I didn't remember it, but goddamn, that, that's about as big as you can push anybody. And he meant more in WCW than he ever meant in the WWF. But unfortunately, at that point, everybody becomes a rock star, the Attitude Era. And I, again, Lex. The four horsemen Lex that I, you know, was in the locker room with every day was not a, a choir boy, but he was a lot closer to goddamn, you know, uh, straight edge than fucking fucked up. But suddenly when everybody's making money and everybody's a rock star, then there's bills and a couple of pills and then Lex admitted all this stuff. He and Elizabeth were both married, but they were both on pills and sneaking off together. It was interesting the way this portrayed Elizabeth, because usually almost everything universally portrays her as, you know, this innocent babe in the woods who got caught up in all this. And this is the first time, and not explicitly said, but it's the first time it's kind of showed her to be as equal a participant as Luger. It's not just the big bad Lex Luger got her hooked on drugs or anything. Well, yeah, I mean, she was a 40-year-old adult human being and had been around the wrestling business and obviously wrestlers for 20 years at that point. So, uh, you know. But anyway, uh, they did gloss over, after Vince bought WCW, <laughs> they, they kind of glossed over it. Well, for the next three years, Lex stayed home and got paid a fortune. It's not like he had an alternative at that point. And then Lex's wife found out about Liz and he started getting DUIs. I had no idea he'd been arrested a dozen times. And and that, you know, and then they go into the the night of uh that Elizabeth died and that his 911 call and him being arrested on fairly big time drug charges not they didn't ever think he had anything to do with Elizabeth's death, although people tried to start that rumor, but they WWE found... WWE did. Didn't they do a thing on their confidential Confidential, that's right. Yeah, well, they, they didn't... They, they gave one of those confusing headlines that would lead the witness to believe. Um, but they found so many drugs in his house, and he's now he's working indies and still on drugs and arrests and... Of course, it was a prison chaplain that converted him. And I, I'm i not even going to comment besides 
trade one addiction for another, but it seems to be working for Lex. And if, after this point, anything makes him happy. But uh, <laughs> this the the videotape of Sting and Lex Luger and Nikita Koloff standing there on the Christian 700 Club TV or whatever, I'm just like, my God, in 1987, if somebody said. And I had talked to Lex at one of these fan fests in the last several years about his neck incident. And I didn't realize it was the San Francisco Cow Palace show that ended in disaster that he was going to when he had the, the issue. But that was the one where the MMA fighters and the wrestlers had issues and people pulled guns because there was nobody there and the promoter didn't pay anybody. And I had heard about it. They tried to book me and I've, heard where it was and who was already booked and said, you're out of your mind. And the midnight express were booked and they never got plane tickets. So my favorite story from that weekend was just a line in the review of it in figure four weekly at the time. And the line was stone cold. Steve Austin showed up and was debriefed by Dr. Mike Leno. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you can't stop Mike Leno from doing those debriefings. Uh, but anyway, apparently Lex was on a plane to San Francisco and was, it, with his newfound Christianity, apparently was more uh, conversational than he used to be and talked to the person next to him in the seat with his head turned for the whole flight. And he told me this himself. It's not a bullshit story. And he woke up in a hotel the next day and was mostly paralyzed. And I don't know whether it had a huge neck swelling. I mean, you know, wrestlers have bone spurs, sharp things, and with him turned that way, did the swelling fucking constrict something, move something into whatever, but he lived practically in bed for a year. And now he's he can live on his own. He uses a wheelchair for a lot of things but he has limited mobility and and he can take care of himself but he's in the top one percent of people with this affliction in the world and uh, probably due to the condition that he you know kept himself in for the most part you know all of his life but but now he's he's happier and he's more stable and humble and contented and coaching young bodybuilders and uh, on nutrition and shit. And, you know, it had an optimistic uplifting finish to the thing. But when, when you think about it, here's another guy who was a, a big name and made a ton of money and had a short career start to finish. It was barely what? 16 years. And that was with uh, taking off after the first 14, that was with taking most of the rest of it off. You think he goes into the Hall of Fame next year? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not saying he's never going to. I don't know about let's not pinpoint next year. Um, but I think if they've... Well, you know what? Not only have they done this and obviously blessed it because they're cooperating with a and e but now vince is not around and vince was probably one of the guys that would hold grudges on two or three or four different names and that may not be applicable anymore so i would think lex will be in there sooner or later and also if not just for a dearth of main event level contenders and he can tell a great story and come off in a sympathetic fashion do you think Lex Luger can get a good night's sleep? Well, it depends now, because, you know, getting a good night's sleep, it's all what you do. See, we've talked about Lex. He unfortunately went down the pharmaceutical path, and that's not good. Everybody knows that's not good. You don't want to do that. You want all natural ingredients that make you fall asleep. You want all natural ingredients to take care of your health, right? That's what our friends at Beam are doing. Because. Poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity. And if you sleep less than six to seven hours a night, some of you, if you sleep less than 14 to 16 hours a night, 
you could have reduced white blood cell count. And if you got reduced white blood cell count, well, the next time you go to give blood, they're going to turn you away. They're going to say, we don't want your blood. Your blood is shit. As a matter of fact, we should report you for the quality of your blood. You don't want that to happen. You do not want to be reported to the authorities because of the quality of your blood. So, you got to hop on the Beam Dream Powder. Beam is the world's most innovative functional wellness brand with unique products for everything from sleep to recovery and their best-selling item, of course, the Dream Powder, the incredibly healthy hot cocoa that gives you a refreshing good night's sleep and makes you feel like a new man or a new woman. Depending on what you've got now, if you've got a, an old man now, you might feel like a new man. If you've got an old woman now, you might feel like a new one. But it'll make you feel like something, this what? dream powder. I guess. Because as we know, statistically, 98% of people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream, and 99% of people experience better sleep quality. And as a matter of fact, the other 1%, the other 1% often wake up able to hear colors. Now, all you got to do is just take some of the Beam Dream powder and mix it into hot water or milk. Milk gives it a little more body. You stir this up and enjoy it before bedtime or before any time. Actually, if you just want to go to sleep, let's say you want to go to sleep before lunch. Take a little nap before lunch. Well, you take a sip of the Beam, boom, instantly your face falls in the chili and you're breaking the crackers. Let's say you want to We've mentioned you can sleep off jail sentences with this stuff. It's much better to be asleep when you're in jail than it is awake. So whatever you want to sleep through, folks, possibly relations with your better half if things are not going well, swig a little bit of this in the bathroom beforehand, and she'll think the snoring is just groans and moans of pleasure. Well, how, about and, just, how about just take it when you're ready to go to sleep? That's what I said. When you need to go to sleep, take some of this shit. Just fire it right down your gullet. And for a limited time only now, you can get $20 off when you go to Shop Beam. That's B-E-A-M, shopbeam.com slash J-C-E. Use the code J-C-E at checkout, and you're going to save $20 off. And if you don't love it, get your money back guaranteed. It's another one of these deals where they're putting their faith in you as an honest consumer to give them an honest and valuable appraisal of their product so that they'll know that the customers are satisfied. Now, if you try to put something over on them, we're not going to be happy and they're not going to be happy. What kind of ingrate you are that you order this stuff, you pay for it, they send it to you, you try it out, and then you say, well, I don't like it. Well, what the hell's the matter with you? And then they've got to send you your money back. It's, you're being a pain in the ass. But they'll do it. Guaranteed. Well, you won't. Shop Beam. What? They won't need to do it because you'll actually enjoy or like using or you'll get some benefits out of Beam. Well, of course you will, but some people lie. See, they want to get over on somebody. They, what they do is they get the Beam and they try the Beam and they have a great night's sleep. And then they say, I can get my money back now that I've had a good night's sleep, overlooking the fact that if they kept the beam, they could get multiple more good nights sleep. But no, they just want to be greedy and they want to pass something by somebody and get something over on somebody. So if you're going to be a little prick, you're going to ask for your money back and they'll give it to you, guaranteed. But they've already given you $20 off with the code JCE at checkout. Shopbeam.com slash JCE. Use that code JCE at checkout. $20. That's $20 they won't be sending you back. Beam.